Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Mervyn Bujah, he, well, I've got to say, I've been in the healthcare industry. I've never, never, ever heard of or experienced a miracle like Mervyn is going to share with us today. He had an encounter with Jesus, but also his case was so severe that there are virtually no survivors from this case. He actually confirmed the number of people and the people in the OR suite while he was in surgery. He should not be with us by clinical definition today. He is, and we're going to be talking about this profound miracle and experience with Jesus in heaven. Mervyn, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you, Randy. It's an awesome honor and a privilege for us to be with you today. Yeah. Thank well, you. Uh, Mervyn, I had problems with uh, just talking because I've never seen anyone survive. I've never read about anyone who survived your procedure. I've never experienced, and I've been in the OR during cardiovascular procedures. You had uh, what's called a transaction or more commonly referred to as a ruptured aorta. Now, the, the aorta is the main artery in the body that supplies blood flow, blood flow from the heart to the rest of the body. Yes. If that ruptures, typically, within a matter of seconds, at utmost minutes, the patient dies. There are only 80% that make it, and that's with immediate intervention. But you're going to tell us that there were hours that went by where you were bleeding out. Mm. Obviously, you're going to be before Jesus, but I'm sorry. I'm just so amazed by this, <laughs> Mervyn. Now, you're a pastor in South Africa, so you were yeah. pastoring at this time in a, in a church there. Tell us uh, where your church is uh and was at the time this was may 9th of 2021 and so yeah, tell it, us it happened uh, on may excuse me it happened on may 9th uh, um, in 2021 and we passed a church out in galvandale in uh, it's an area in in port elizabeth um synonymous for for gangsterism and drugs and it's, it's it's one of the it's one of the dangerous areas in South Africa or, or, or in Port Elizabeth for that matter, um, and we're right in the heart of it, um, bordering on another uh, gangland called Helenvale, and so a lot of those people there come to our church and and, and we look after them and we pastor them, you know, um, serve them in the community. Wow, yeah. So not only were uh, did you go through this experience, but you were ministering to those who are the neglected, the most, um, let's say the most, uh, how, what's the word for it? The most of the people that, that are the, I don't want, I don't want to say the worst of the worst because that's not a, a Christian term, but the, in the, the world's the eyes. Needy, the most needy and the most need of, uh, needy of salvation. <laughs> there we go. I love that. That's a pastor's heart saying it that way. That's great. So tell us about now, you have a wonderful family. I've met your son, and, um, and and you're going through just your routine, and then yeah. something happened. Yeah. Well, we it, it was Mother's Day. Like I said, it was Mother's Day on the 9th of May, and so my wife was ministering to the women or, or on Mother's Day that day. And um, we had planned so nicely uh, um, to spend time with the family that, that um, Sunday afternoon because it was Mother's Day. Um, I've, got a, I've got a son, and I've got two daughters. Uh, I've got five grandchildren. Um, the grandchildren were here. Um, my my son, my my daughter and her husband were here. So we were just going to spend some time with them. Uh, um, and 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 what we were going to do is then after Mother's Day we were going to leave the Sunday morning and travel up the west coast um, and spend our anniversary, which was the 11th of May, to spend it at a coastal town, a coastal resort somewhere, you know. But at 11 o'clock that morning, my life changed. My life changed. Day. Um, I was, I was sitting downstairs and then, and then I had this enormous pain come across my chest 
And then it felt as if something had dropped, something inside of me had dropped. And I made my way up upstairs, up the uh, staircase. I made my way and I said to my wife and my son, I said, there's something wrong here. I said, I'm in trouble. There's something wrong here. I've, I've never, ever experienced this in my life yet. You know, and I still said to my son, I said, take, um, take the extension cable and plug it into the wall. I'm going to rip this part off. So I've got the bare electrical cables here and you switch it on and I'm going to electrocute myself. <laughs> and if you see me in trouble, <laughs> if you see me in trouble, just switch it off, just switch it off. And 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 that's what happened, you know, I, I held it. And then I said to him, I was still in control. I said, switch it off, it's fine. And then I said, guys, I can't feel my legs. I, I, in You know, within 10 minutes, I was paralyzed from the waist down. I couldn't walk because there was no blood going to my spine. There was no blood going to my legs. And then I, I was paralyzed. And then two grown men, my son and, and, and one of our neighbors came and they loaded me into the vehicle um, because my room is downstairs. Um, they couldn't bring me down the spiral staircase. So they had to load me into the vehicle uh, where, uh, and then bring me down the driveway where my bedroom is. And I remember saying this, I said, Lord, if this is how you want to take me, if this is how you're calling me out, then please, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. But if, if, if not, then please, I want to walk. I want to walk. And, and and the only words I could say at that time, even while they were reversing down the driveway, I said, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And that's just the power of the name. You know, because when they stopped and they opened the doors, I said to my son and and, and our neighbor, who was, who was a Muslim, by the way, and we're good friends now, um, I, I, I said, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk. And my son said, no, dad, you can't walk. I said, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk. And I got up and I walked. Ten minutes ago, I was paralyzed, you know, from the waist down. But I walked into my bedroom and I laid on my bed and I waited for the doctor to come around. So mm -hmm. even in that, there was a miracle where God made me uh, walk. He gave me back my legs just to walk back into the bedroom. Yeah, yeah, to put that in context. So you're not getting blood flow to the yeah. legs. So the legs can't move. No. By the way, I would not recommend for anyone watching this, <laughs> do not shock yourself if you're in a situation. <laughs> so, so Mervyn, we know you're not a doctor, okay? <laughs> you're a no. pastor. <laughs> but but no. even that you survived, which is a yes. miracle in itself. And so there's no blood flow getting to your no. body at this point, or very little blood flow, uh, yeah. because your your art your artery, main artery in the body has been ruptured. And, and 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 this was this all happened it started at 11 o'clock the morning you know 11 o'clock the sunday morning this is all started at 11 o'clock the sunday morning and then my doctor got here at about half past 12 he took my blood pressure which was over 200 and um, he gave me some pills and he, and he calmed me down and he said just sleep it off just sleep it off because you didn't know what it was and um, <clears throat> at about three o'clock the afternoon, I said to my son, something's not right because the pain won't go away. The pain won't go away. So we, we he loaded me into the vehicle. I got into the vehicle and we, had, we drove around looking for a, a, a trauma unit that was open at the time, you know, a, 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 a hospital casualty unit that was open at the time that could examine me. And all the hospitals were closed. They, they, they were only open for COVID patients. They wouldn't take, they weren't taking on any emergencies. But we got a hospital, a private hospital um, in town that that at the time was so busy that we got there after three. I only got to see a doctor at eight o'clock the night. That's how busy they were. And all that time, all that time, God was sustaining me. All that time, wow. God was sustaining me. So this yeah. is um, a period then of, what, about... Uh... Nine hours, that, that ten was, hours? That was close to nine hours. That was close to nine hours since it wow. happened, you know. And then when doctors saw me, the very first thing he did was he sent me in for a CT scan. And they scanned my heart and everything and, and brought me back into the, into the trauma unit. And so when the results came back, he says, I'm going to send you for another scan. Because he, he said, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. I'm going to send you for another scan. Then he sent me for a second scan. And when the second scan came back, he says, oh, uh, I, I'm having a heart attack now. So he, actually, he, he actually had to call another doctor in to come and help him at the trauma unit because he says, I can't handle this. I've never seen this in my life. 
He says, people normally go from here straight to the morgue. And when they do an autopsy, then they realize what it is that, that caused the death. And, 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 and I want to, he said, no, 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 sit dead still, sit dead still. He says, we need to operate now. He says, we need to operate now. This can't wait. He says, we need to operate now. Then I said, doctor, you need to understand that I don't have medical aid. And you need to tell me what the operation is going to cost me. And he, he went there and he came back with a quotation. He says, the operation is going to cost you 2 million rand, which is in your currency about $100,000. It's going to cost you about $100,000. And I said, Doc, you need to let me die because I don't have this money. He says, no, we're going to make a plan. He found one of the state hospitals, which was just across the road, not far from there. Got me moved from there into the state hospital. And he, he said, these guys are going to sort you out right now. You know, So they moved me from there straight to ICU. And when I got into ICU, there was another doctor. He came and he did some scans. And, and I didn't know him at the time. I didn't know this doctor at the time. But he happened to be, he was friends with the keyboard player in our church. I didn't know that. He didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So we, he was interviewing me and he was writing everything down. And then he said to me, he said, I can stabilize you now because at, by that time it was 12 o'clock the, 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 the following morning already, you know, early hours of the morning. He says, these guys have been up all day. We, we, we need to get a team in here for you. And, and if I bring them in now, they're going to be tired because this is about a 16-hour operation, he says, and I want them to be fresh when say, I can stabilize you. I'm going to be with you all night. If anything happens, we'll open you up immediately, he says. So they put me onto, into ICU. They connected me onto all the machines. And, and he says, uh, I'll get them to come in, in, in the morning. You know? So they yeah. only operated on me the Monday morning um, at about quarter to 11 so wow. for, for almost 24 hours, you know, for almost 24 hours, I was in this condition. Well, uh, you know, so here you have the first doctor that uh, was looking at the CAT scan and he almost had a heart attack because he couldn't believe yeah. that you were alive. Yeah. That was at about nine, 10 hours. Now yeah, you're yeah, at 24 that, that is, hours. Is, yes, now that, I'm at 24 hours. So the, the miracle the doctor observed that you shouldn't have been alive is yeah. now compounded by the fact that we're over twice that yeah. and you're bleeding out. So yeah. what, again, this, I mean, it, this just doesn't happen. It just does not yeah. happen. Of all the cases, and I have observed and worked uh, to some extent in, in a lot of the major hospitals within the United States of America, I've never seen a patient survive this uh, rupture, a, ruptured aorta for longer than an hour. And usually, uh, you know, less than 30 minutes, but it's only an hour if there's intervention uh, yeah. that's made immediately, cracking the chest open, then um, cauterizing, the, you know, stitching, repairing the ruptured artery. So, God is somehow clotting during this time, 24 hour period. He yes. is supernaturally clotting that, yes. that aorta to get you through it. Yeah. And, and this doctor happened, the, the very first surgeon that, that admitted me to ICU happens to be a, a new believer. Well, he was quite a, um, a fairly new believer. And, um, he he couldn't believe this. So when he went home, he was, well, this happened uh, a, a day later, he was talking to his friend, which is our keyboard place. He's, you know, there's this pastor that came into hospital and, and, and blah, blah, blah. And this is what happened. He says, I can't believe it. And, and, and he says, when they opened me, it was as if my blood was clotting on the inside. He says that that is inexplicable. They, they can't see how the blood clots on the inside. You know, and then the, the keyboard player said to him, well, um, that's my pastor because we, we all got the news that he was in hospital now. And this is what happened. You know, when he told him about what my name was, et cetera, et cetera. He said, no, that's my pastor. You know, so yeah, they're getting they're getting me ready Monday morning to, to go into the into theater. And one of the surgeons, um, the head um, cardiac surgeon comes to me and I'm lying. Uh, they're busy wheeling me down to OR. 
And as they're busy reading, he says, stop. And he speaks to me. He says, I'm Dr. Uh, Dr. Koshi, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He says, I'll, I'll be operating on you. He says, does your family know that you're here? I says, yes, they know. He says, have you spoken to them? I says, no, I haven't. And he says, nurse, please, please bring a phone. And she brought a phone. Because it was COVID, the family weren't allowed to come to hospital. You know, they weren't allowing anyone into the hospital unless it was an emergency. And then he gives me the phone, or, or after he's dialed my wife's number, he does my wife's number, he gives me the phone, and he says to me, speak to your family. And these were his words to me. He says, say goodbye to them. Say goodbye. Because he says, the three patients before you didn't, didn't make it through this, opera the, this operation. And I spoke to my wife. I said, baby, they're going to operate on me now. Um, I'll probably chat to you when I come out of uh, um, a recovery room. And he says, no. He says, no, he's pointing down to me. He says, say goodbye, say goodbye. And, and her words to me is, don't worry, the whole world is praying for you. And I said, yes, I love you too. And thank you for prayers and I'll chat to you soon. And he takes the phone from me and he says to me, I told you to say goodbye. I said to him, doc, I understand that you know what you're doing and, and, and I trust that. But my faith in God is more. I, I, I have more faith in God than that. And if he wants me to, to survive this, I will. If he doesn't want me to survive, then I won't. My life is in his hands. And he just shook his head and they wheeled. And that was the last because by then the the uh, uh, the anesthetist was with me. Anesthesia started setting in. And, and that was the last I remembered from them wheeling me to the operating theater. You know? You were you and, were issued a death sentence basically by the surgeon going into the case. Absolutely. And, and, and I Absolutely. can understand that because he had he had suggested you might be in there up to 16 hours. Yeah. Now, we should understand that in a hard case, any hard case, open heart case, that you don't want the patient to be in surgery for longer than uh, 10, 12 hours utmost because generally because of the loss of blood flow, not only are you yeah. at risk of, of dying um, because of the bleed, which here in your case was excessive, mm -hmm. but also there's typically brain damage and you seem to be a very cogent, very intelligent man. So you, you didn't suffer any brain damage. Normally we see patients coming out of a case like that and they've suffered some uh, form of permanent damage. Yes. Um, um well, uh, well, doctor said to me there was a 95% chance of me suffering brain damage. And actually, he said that to my son. He says, if your dad survives, this is going to be a vegetable. You know, they gave me a whole lot of side effects. He, he said to me, um, you'll be blind, he said, because you lose your eyesight. You, you, you'll go deaf. There'll be organ failure. You'll be paralyzed. He said, um, he, he said so, and there'll be strokes. Uh, because of the, the 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 blood clotting, there'll be strokes, and he gave me a whole long list, and I did I I I, I def denied him. I said I, I refuse to accept that, um, because I'm cancelling every word you're speaking now, and I know that the Lord my God is going to is going to heal me completely. Right? And he just shook his head. He just shook his head. Uh, and I, you know, you know, and at the time I, I wasn't a medical doctor. But I had faith, and I said, uh, I refuse to accept that. I refuse to accept that. I said, I'm, I'm not accepting that. I, I do believe that God is going to heal me completely. Wow. You know, so 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 they will me, and I'm and I'm and I'm while they're busy operating on me, they they cut me open. But I had an out of body experience because while they were operating on me, I actually stood and I stood and I watched them. And while, while they were, you know, my, my, my chest was open and I saw all the blood, I was covered in blood, but I was also, like I normally say, I was also covered by the blood. I was also uh -huh. covered by them, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and while they were working on me, I stood and I watched them and I counted eight people around, uh, around uh, the, 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 the operating theater. I counted eight people there. And um, while they were operating on me, something must have happened because they were frantically moving around. And, and, and I think in my spirit, I started to fear, you know, because I, I could see there was something not right here, you know, this one doing that. And, and, and they were frantically running around. So I knew that something was wrong. But while I was doing that, you know, while I was watching all of that, and while I was, I had this fear upon me, I just felt this hand on my shoulder and he came to stand next to me. And he said, Mervyn, you're going to be okay. 
you're going to be okay. Mm. And then with, with one swoop, he, he, almost as if he lifted me and he, and he was tall because I, when I was standing, I had my hand through his thigh. I had my hand through his leg and I was standing holding onto his thigh when he said, you're going to be okay. But then he lifted me up and he put me on his back, kind of like lifted me onto his shoulders, you know, and he held my hands like this and, and, and he walked with me. And it, it almost looked as if we were walking through a forest, but it, it wasn't a forest, it was a garden, because I could see all the beautiful colors of the flowers. There was violet and, and there was indigo and blue and purple and green and red and yellow and white. And I, and I was just admiring the flowers as we were walking, you know, through this garden that he was carrying me through. And then we came to an open clearing where Randy, where I, I, I've, I have never ever seen such green grass in my life. It was beautiful green grass, eh? so green. And, and in, this, in this grass, I saw these lambs, bright white lambs, they were busy playing and uh, because they were busy playing with butterflies and there were butterflies with it. And then I asked him, I said, do you bring them here when you bring them home? Because I thought he was taking me home. And he says, no, I just bring them here while I'm fixing them. And then he took me and he put me down into the grass and he sat next to me and I put my head on his lap and I was watching all of this and then I fell asleep. I fell asleep. I was gone. I fell asleep. Oh. Couldn't hear a word. Couldn't hear a word. <laughs> so, okay. You're, you're saying you're on the table. You're, yeah. you're under anesthesia right now. You're, you're not, uh, you don't have any cogency. You're, you're out. Uh -huh. And you're okay. seeing eight people in the OR suite. Now you don't yes. you don't know surgery. What the OR uh, cardiovascular team looks like. You've never yeah. been in surgery, never. I think, at this never. point, right? Never. Right, never. So okay, so you're seeing the surgeon. You're seeing maybe an assistant uh, by his side, or there a physician assistant, or a, or a nurse. Uh, you're seeing a scrub nurse, circulating nurse. You're seeing the perfusion, perfusionist. You're seeing yeah. a technician. You don't know any of that. The OR team is that is comprised of that number of people, but you're seeing that, which validates. You went back to the the uh, doctor afterward uh, to yeah. validate, and you said, "I saw eight people." What what did? Yeah. What did he say when you told him you knew exactly how many people were in that OR suite? And, 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 and he's a new believer. And, and he stood there and he counted and he said to me, there was a perfusionist, a, cardi a cardiac, a, a, a cardiology a perfusionist. He said there were two anesthetists. He says there was a scrub nurse and there were, and there were like five surgeons, um, you know, a, a, a around this. Uh, one was an assistant and, and the others were there. And he said to me, Yes, there were eight. He validated that. He said, yes, there were eight. And he actually counted them on his fingers. And as he named them, he said, that person was there, that person was there, that person was there, that person. And he counted them on his head. Because at, at, at first, I thought it was a dream, you know, because our look, um, j j just, coming, just coming back to after I fell asleep, I heard him call my name four times. I, I, I heard the Lord call my name four times. And I, and I heard him call me Mervyn, Mervyn. Because of the conversation we had, I recognized his voice. You know, and the Bible says, my sheep know my voice and they hear me when I call. And he, and he called me and, and, and I could hear him calling me four times. But the fifth time, there was someone else calling me. And that, that got my attention because I thought, where is he? You know, I, I, I was just laying on his lap and I was so comfortable. And I thought to myself, where is he? And that got my attention. And then I woke up. And, and to find out that the fifth person that was calling me was the doctor calling me out of a coma because I've been in a coma. I was in a coma for three days and induced coma for, for three days. They had me in a coma. And after coming out of the coma, being in ICU, this thing kept on playing through my head, you know. And I thought to myself, was this a dream or, 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 or was this reality? You, you know, I, I wasn't sure. Look, I, I was still very groggy um, coming out of the coma. 
But then when I got to speak to the surgeon, uh, you know, this new believer, when I got to speak to him, I said, Dr. Grieber, please um, just, just tell me, man, I counted eight people in the operating theater while you guys were operating on me because I had an out-of-body experience. Tell me how many people were in that operating theater. And then he confirmed the number for me, he says, oh. and then I knew it. Then I knew, and I was at peace that that that, that was the Lord. You know, that was the Lord that was with me. That was confirmation that... Uh... This no, wasn't absolutely. a dream. Absolutely. This was this was an experience where your spirit had been released. Because, by the way, uh, as I've said time and time again, the definition of clinical death is when the heart stops. Yes. Uh, yes. And the brain soon follows because the blood flow doesn't get the brain. But in your case, Mervyn, the blood wasn't getting to your brain yeah. because it wasn't pumping. It was leaking through, if you will, this aortic artery and it was leaking through the blood wasn't getting to your brain so when they put you under the anesthetic not only did your heart stop for that period yeah. during surgery but you weren't your brain was not functioning as well so this is this is your spirit uh body yeah. uh, that you're yeah. that you're accounting for now the back to an, an interesting part of of your experience uh in this place with the Lord Jesus. And that is that you saw that Jesus told you that you were in a place where he fix, fixes people. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm bringing, I, I bring them here while I fix them, you know, and then uh, I then yeah. So then they, he put me down into the grass and I was laying on the grass with my, my head in his lap, um, you know, and then only, it was only afterwards that this, that, that the scripture reminded me that he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Mm -hmm. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A common question that uh, people have when they hear an experience is, I want to know, I want to get a blueprint of heaven. Okay, I want to know that uh, why some go before uh, the gates of heaven Others are in it. Why some people have this extraordinarily detailed ex description and others don't. And why some people don't have any experience at all uh, that have uh, clinically died. And, and what you're telling us is a different facet of where, and we've got to all things, the, the, we do not know the mind of Christ, neither do we know the expansiveness of, of God's kingly realm and heaven and this kind of, uh, I'm my term, not yours, Mervyn, this kind of waiting station where he heals before crossing that threshold into, into heaven because he's healing you in this place. It sounds very much from what you describe from my experience and others that you were in heaven, the brilliancy of the greens uh, and all of the flowers and all that, but it was in a special kind of, I'm thinking it's, it's kind of like and that Jesus brought you to what would be um, the ICU of heaven, if you will. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I like that. <laughs> yes. Like that. Amazing. Amazing. So he's obviously he's intending to send you back. And he tells you that yeah. that you're going to be okay, doesn't he? No, he tells me that he reassures me, you know. When he lays his righteous right hand upon my shoulder and he says, you're going to be okay. Um, and, and, and so, yeah. Wow. And so, you know, when I came out of, when I came out of the, the um, ICU, they moved me into a ward. Um, and, and being in the ward, um, there were more people, more other doctors that were uh, that had access to me. So we had doctors coming from the university with their students and, 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 and just asking me, Tell me, what did you do different? You, you know, how, how is it that you survived this thing? And I said, I can't tell you. I said, I don't have the answers. You know, I, I, I said, all I can tell you is Jesus. That's all I can tell you. And when the, some of them, when they look at you, you, you can see now that uh, they, they don't really believe in that. But there are those that, that acknowledge that and they can shake their heads and say, yeah, this is only the Lord that can do this. Because doctors wanted to learn from my experience so that they could save a life in the future. You know, they, they, they wanted to save lives in the future. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, well, about a year after that, 
a year after that, I I, I met up with the, uh, one of the head surgeons, Dr. Koshi. We 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 we're good friends now, um, you know. And when he saw me, he went to play squash, and the day I met him, because uh, my my cousin's husband plays squash with him, and you see how how, how the Lord just connects and knits things together. And so I walked into the squash courts one day and he looked at me and he, he just went like this and he says, I need to take a photo with you. He says, because I've never seen faith like yours. He says, I've never seen faith like yours. And um, we connected again. And one day I was thinking about him. And, and then I, I, I sent him a message, you know, the, the Sunday, because I, I was thinking about him the Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday. And I thought, you know, I, I want to send him a message. But I know he's normally busy and he's in theater or whatever. So I just sent him a message. Hey, Doc, I've been thinking about you. How are you doing? And he sent me a message back. He says, I've been thinking about you. He says, on Friday, a lady came into the hospital with exactly the same condition that you had. And then I remembered what we did to you. And I applied that to her. And today she's alive. Wow. So, 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 so just that part of the testimony. You know that 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 I could help to save someone else's life by them using me as a guinea pig, <laughs> uh-huh. as, as a guinea pig, because I I don't have an aorta anymore, or, or most of my aorta has been cut away, and I have a Teflon tube grafted in now, uh, into in, to where the aorta is. I mean, I mean, there's no blood vessel in the in the body that's big enough that they can use, so they put in a Teflon tube as an aorta now for me, yes. part of my. Wow. Yes, well, I don't know what the surgeon had learned from your case, certainly, but uh, he learned an interventional uh, procedure, obviously, for uh, an aortic valve, or aortic aorta replacement, that is, not a valve, because there's a valve in, in your arteries, but he was replacing the entire uh, artery. So that might have been fresh for him to be able to do that procedure. But again, I'm I'm gonna apologize to our audience how how shocking this is because I've been in this space, cardiovascular. I've worked with minimally invasive cardiovascular surgery, robotic, you know, uh bypass. I've been in numerous cases and I've led clinical teams in uh in those cases as well. Uh this just is not clinically possible. It's not clinically possible. It just is not. There's no way the body can survive this. Well, I mean, I mean, doctors said to me, they, they said to me, they, there's no scientific uh, explanation and there's no medical explanation why you're still alive. He says, because clinic, you, you're supposed to be dead. That, that's all they say, that, that we can't believe this. He said, there's no explanation why you're still alive. That, that's his, and, and so I know it's a supernatural intervention that happened there. Um, you know, when when all of this happened, um, I was lying in hospital one night in, in in a general ward, and at about six o'clock that evening, my doctor friend came around to pay me a visit, and um, he says, uh, "Pastor, um, how are you doing?" I said, "I'm fine," and um, he says, um, "We've got a problem up in ICU." He says, "We've got a problem up in ICU. Um, there's a lady in ICU. She's busy dying. She's on a lost." She's, she's been without, um, she hasn't spoken for the past five days. She's just been laying there and, and we, we had to call the family in now to pay their last respects to her because she's on her way, she's busy dying. Would you mind coming to pray for her? Because I'd started to pray for the people in the hospital, um, even in my in my case. And, and you, you must remember um, th- that it was COVID, so they weren't allowing any pastors into the hospital, no priests into the hospital, no imams into the hospital, no Hindu priests, no one was allowed into the hospital, you know. And so and so the Lord takes a broken pastor and he puts him there. Mm. He says, you're going you're gonna to do my will, you know. Because I, I wasn't concerned about, about, about why I was there. I wasn't concerned about my position, why God put me there. Uh, I needed to know what my purpose was for to be there. But nevertheless, he says to me, there's a lady up in ICU and she's busy dying. Um, would you mind praying for us? So I said, yeah, I'll go and pray for her. But he says, there's another problem. I said, what is the other problem? He said, no, she's Muslim. She's, she's, not, she's not Christian. She's a Muslim. I said, yes, if the family would give me authority to pray for her, I'll pray for her. 
and he says, wait, I'm coming now. So he goes back up and uh, he comes down with, uh, uh, with one of the family members and the family member happens to know me. And he says, no, Uncle Mervyn, you can come and pray for my mom anytime. And I said, okay, he comes with a wheelchair. So they put me in the wheelchair and I've got a drip in this hand and I've got a drain in this hand because of the wound is still busy draining. So I've got a drip and a drain and they're wheeling me into ICU. So as they bring me down into ICU, the family stands there and they look at me and they thought, yo, this man needs more prayers than, than our mother, man. You know, she, she needs more prayers than our mother. But I, I went and he put me at the edge of the bed and I said, doctor, would you mind holding my, my drip? Mind holding the drain? And I asked their permission to put my hands on their mother's feet. And she was lying still in the bed and I prayed for her. And I said, Lord, if it's, if it's your will, would you lift this woman up from out of a, a deathbed? Would you lift her up? Would you raise her up? And they were looking at me and I wasn't even concerned and I was praying. And when I said, Amen, this woman sat up in the bed. She's a Muslim woman. She sat up in the bed. And her first words, she hasn't been eating, hasn't been speaking for five days. She just pointed to me and she said to me that you belong in a big office like the president. Like the president. Mm. And the family was there and they were weeping because now their mother was up sitting and she was starting to talk to them and they were speaking to her. And I said, doctor, can you take me back? My work is done here. And so I went down and he took me back to my, to my ward and I went back. Yeah. Mm. So even if it was just for that, that the Lord took me there and had to break me to bring me there, then it was worth it. You know, yeah. Maybe she, she met the, the true Lord, Jesus Christ. Yes. I know in Islam, yes. there's a belief in Jesus as a prophet. Of course, Jesus was called a prophet, but he never, he never described himself as a prophet. He described himself as, uh, as God, uh, the I am. Uh, he said, if you've seen me, Jesus, you've seen the father, um, so maybe she, by, uh, by inference, perhaps when she was seeing you in the president's office there, she was seeing the, the, the man of truth and maybe she accepted that truth because subsequent to that, she did, uh, she did, uh, she did die, didn't she? She got up from a death, well, uh, what they called a deathbed, and I, you know, and she only died three weeks later after I left the hospital. She died only three weeks later after I had left. Wow. So the Lord, still, the Lord still preserved her for another five weeks. Another five weeks. It's a lot of time for God to work on someone. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. someone's heart, that is. There's everything is is supernatural about your your story, Mervin. And so, um, I I'd like to ask a couple of questions in terms of your overall experience. Usually, there's a why that's answered as to why God allowed this to be. Uh, and in your case, obviously, He saved your your life. Um, and the second is how it changed you. Um, so if you would be kind enough to answer those questions, please. Why, first of all, um, why do you think God had allowed you to go through this experience? Because if not, if not for God's intervention, you wouldn't be speaking with us today. I, th I think it was, it, it was a, t uh, the, the why would be a, a testimony for, for so many, uh, so many other people that, that don't believe in, and, and don't believe in the supernatural don't believe in the healing hand of God. Um, secondly, um, for 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 the work that He still has me to do, you know, there's such a lot of work, and for me to go and tell people about His goodness, tell people not just about what I've studied or not just what I've learned, but what I've been through, that there is a living God, you know, to go and testify to the world that there is a living God, and I am a I'm an example of that. I'm a testimony of that. That there is still a living God out there. And there's still a living God that heals and saves today. You know, like I said to you earlier on, I, I wasn't concerned about my position. Why would God bring me through this? But what was your purpose for it? You know, uh, I, I was asking God, what was your purpose? I mean, I've been, when, when, I, when I could walk around, I was praying for everyone in the hospital because no one was allowed in. 
Um, we were worshipping there. No, no one was allowed to come and worship, but we were worshipping there. Um, I, I, I had a Hindu man that also came to Christ because he asked me to pray for him. And I said, um, I can only pray for you because I don't want my God to fight with your God um, because your God is going to get hurt and you might get hurt in the process. But <laughs> if you accept Jesus Christ in your, as your Lord and Savior, then I know that my prayers will cover you. You know, and we're still in contact today, and 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 he's he's he's, he's a full blown Christian today, um, because of what God did there for him, and 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 our God healed and restored him there. In fact, when he goes anywhere else, he, he phones me and he says, "Pray for me. I'm going there, and I'm going to do this." Um, so that, so that was just part of the purpose that that God had for me, and and so I know that my work here on earth is still vast, still vast. It's also made me appreciate life more. Mm. It's made me appreciate my, my, my children, my family, uh, because you can be so focused on, on, on a ministry and so focused on church that you, you kind of neglect your own family in the process. So I've, I've, I've learned that I need to appreciate my family more um, and I need to appreciate um, my grandchildren more. You know, uh, I put family first now. Even if I have to refuse ministry and say I won't be able to be there because I've got a, 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 a date with my granddaughter or a date with my a soccer date with my, my grandson, I'm going to be there. You're going to have to excuse me. I won't be able to do that. If you can't find someone else, then we're going to have to postpone it or do it on a different day. Mm. So important. Um, oftentimes, I think, uh, especially those who are in ministry, uh, as in work, any work, secular or, or Christian or otherwise, um, can be consuming. And we feel that our purpose is to achieve something, this or that. But one of the lessons that Jesus taught me in heaven is that I needed to remain focused on him. Moment by moment, he would reveal that purpose. And the moments that are, he presents to us, and you, you've said as such with your family, that moment of that soccer game, we know how those little moments can mean so much to our loved ones um, that we need to focus our attention on the moments that are presented to us because they only last for that moment and then they leave and they'll never be, never be regained. Yeah. My brother, um, this is one of the most miraculous, if not the most miraculous, now, I, I was also told that I was a walking dead man and I should not have lived as well. So, you know, I can empathize with that. But when your case, um, it, just, it just still confounds me from a clinical side. I operate from a spiritual mindset of, of heaven and having been there and having spoken with a number of people who have been to heaven after, after dying. Um, but there's also that other side of me, which is still somewhat scientifically minded, which yeah. says, you know, God, you are so powerful. You are so miraculous and, and, and you are all knowing and all powerful, uh, the, the most intelligent, the most talented, the most amazing person in the world doesn't even come close to God's. Uh, to God's mind, his power, and his love. Yeah. Well, Mervyn, I, I thank you so much for being with us. Uh, uh, we're at that point where it's an honor for me to ask our guests to, to pray for our audience. Would you be so kind as to pray for our audience, please? Absolutely. Just before we pray, um, I, I just want to share this last, last detail. If we had left the Monday as we planned, and this happened on our journey, I wouldn't. I would not have made it because my wife doesn't drive. Um, you know. You know. So I, we we'd been stuck in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere along the side of the road, and she would have been in trouble. I would have been in trouble. Um, so God's timing and his and 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 his purpose is 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 perfect, you know. Um, it's perfect. Um, it's really really. And 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 I just want to say to you tonight also that um, irrespective of what happens, but we know that God works everything, all things together for the good of those who, who love Him and who are the called according to His purpose. Mm -hmm. um, according. Romans 8, 28. Yes. yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
Well, I'm going to uh, ask you for a final word after our prayer to uh, anything else you would like to say to the audience uh, while I recover from my amazement at this uh, this account. But would you be kind enough to, to pray for our audience now, please? Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Uh, Father, we just we give you all the glory and we give you all the honor and the praise for life right now, Father. Thank you that you still saw it fit today to pour out your breath upon us and that we can be with you this side of eternity, O oh God. And so, Father, thank you for your healing of our lives. Thank you that you are the righteous right hand that sustains them, O oh God. And we thank you that you are in all things, Father. And we cannot turn to anyone. We cannot turn to anyone, Father, for, for faith. We cannot turn to anyone for hope, O oh God. We cannot turn to anyone for love, Father, but to you, Father. And so we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for what you are busy doing, even through Randy's ministry right now, Father, that you're busy touching thousands and millions of lives out there, O oh God. And thank you that you are bringing people to repentance and that you are bringing people to restoration, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. So we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor, and we give you all the praise, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 And Mervyn, something you said, which uh, I was amused by and also uh, impressed by, was you were talking to the uh, Hindu man as you prayed for the uh, Muslim woman who uh, was on her deathbed. And you said to the Hindu man, well, I don't, something to the effect of, if I pray to my God and you pray to your God, my God will, what was the word for it now? Remind me. The fight yeah. with your God. <laughs> and he your would, God might hurt. <laughs> yeah, your, your God might be hurt. <laughs> so uh, I, if, if you are out there now and either... You are like me as an agnostic or an atheist, and you don't have a God, or you have a God, and he was a God that was impressed upon you by a single flawed human being. Um, and then I inv we invite you to know the God uh, that was a perfect yes. uh, deity that walked on earth uh, because he loves us so much. But we also have to remember, to your point, Mervyn, is that our God is so powerful that we can't tempt our God, we can't ignore our God, we can't live our life in ignorance or rejection of that God. So now here, we're giving you the opportunity now, whatever God, whether it be a God of yourself, a God of the universe, a God of some other, uh, you know, self-professing prophet or all-knowing person, whatever that God is, we invite you now to accept the God, the one true God uh, of Jesus Christ, um, the one who was sent to the cross because he declared himself when Pontius Pilate said, who are you? He said two words. He said, I am now, that was a term the Jews knew at the time. That was a term they knew as the declaration of God. God had referred to himself in the book of Exodus as I am. So they knew what that meant. Uh, and the Jews at that time uh, knew what that meant. The religious leaders, that, that is, they knew what he was saying. He was professing himself as not only the I am, but the Emmanuel that uh, Isaiah had prophesied of God in the flesh. So that's the one you need to follow. Uh, yes, any others, and, and whatever belief you have is going to be crushed. It really is. So we invite you now 
to pray for what he did for you on the cross and say this, something to that effect, on your own words, whatever. It's in your heart. You have to, have to believe it. Say, I, I, I just, I, I've fallen away. I've sinned. I've, all of us have, by the way. I've sinned. I, I can't do it on my own. I need you, Lord Jesus. I know you went to the cross for me to, to sacrifice yourself so that you could take on my sins and the penalty thereof. And I, I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to take the lordship over my life. I ask you to take the controls of my life. I, I surrender myself to you, Lord Jesus. And, and I give myself to you so that you might dwell within me with your, whole, your, your spirit, uh, that I might live my, the rest of my days for you and you alone. Guide me with your Holy Spirit. Just give me wisdom uh, to honor you all the days of my life remaining. And if you've done that, let us know at randyk.org. We want to celebrate with you. There's a celebration in heaven going for you uh, uh, on Absolutely. behalf of you if you prayed that for the first time. And even if you've asked forgiveness of him, having known him as a believer in Jesus Christ, still he's washed your sins as far as the east is from the west. You're cleansed. You're, you're, you're a white slate, if you will, right? Clean slate, I should say. So um, we want to know about uh, this and celebrate that with you. So as I said, Mervyn, I want to give you the final words before uh, my sign-off. Anything you would like to share with our audience? Yeah, I just want to say to the audience um, this evening that we serve a living God. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm a testimony to that. I am sitting here tonight and I'm sharing this with you because we serve a living God. He's not dead. My God is alive. You know, and, 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 and he says that in me, you will live and move and have my being. And so I live and I move and I have my being through him and through no one else. And, 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 and God is, is, is real. He is alive. He's, he's, he's not some uh, um, figment of imagination. You know, I'm sitting here Well, I, I got saved because the day that I, that, I, that I wanted to commit family suicide and the Lord saved me. That was in, in, in 2006. He saved me. I was about to commit family suicide. And that same God that saved me on that day came and rescued me when I was lost in the operating theater, when I was lost. And, 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 and the Bible says that he leaves the 99 and he comes off to the one that is lost. And when he finds him, he picks him up and he puts him on his shoulders. And, and, and so if God could do that for me, the same God that can do that for me can do it to each and every one of you that's listening to my voice tonight. He's able to save. He still saves. He still heals. He still restores. And the power of his blood has not been lost. He still has power in his blood the blood that covered me when I was covered in blood. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Mervyn. I, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate your ministry. I appreciate the power of your words uh, that speak. And I, I have a feeling that we're going to uh, continue this and that there's uh, more to be had. I know we are uh, starting my family and uh, I just feel you're a part of my family, God's family. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have a, a prayer of uh, meetings also and things of that nature. I just, I just am still in awe. And uh, I, I thank you so, so much. I'm going to be going off and praying right now just to uh, bring this to the Lord, to uh, just, a, just in awe in his mightiness. So I do have some good news for you. And that is, if you are in Christ Jesus have some wonderful news. Be of good cheer because Amen. heaven is in your future. Take Amen. care you and so God much. bless. Lovely chatting to you. Thanks. It was an honor being with you. Guys. Thank you. Take care. God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.